if you're a student, imagine a student who's overwhelmed with all of these resources, how do they pick and choose which things to engage with? It might be that some topics actually are not amenable to a video. They're better delivered to the student either through face-to-face -face teaching and God forbid we ever lose, lose our face-to-face -face interactions with students, which we've often had to put up with this year in particular. Maybe a textbook version, maybe activity sheets are the best way to get students learning in a particular topic. So if you decide to make a video, make sure it's for the right reasons. Videos are not the panacea, and we'll come back to that towards the end. So when I think about this, selecting topics for videos, okay, what is suitable for a video and what perhaps is not? Maybe it's suitable to other, other ways of thinking. I thought I'd just illustrate this by an example, something that chemistry teachers could all relate to. And you might not agree with me on this one, but I was thinking about organic chemistry. I was thinking about functional groups. And I was thinking about naming molecules. In my mind, when I think about teaching students about alkenes, alkynes, alkanes, ketones, alcohols, and so on. You now there's a family of a dozen or so functional groups. I don't think you need to create a video to teach students about those things. I think you can. I think it would still be really useful to students. But there's not really a lot of process going on there. You're not, you're not going to be able to illustrate to students how to do a lot of that thinking process. Now, naming organic molecules that's another story altogether because it's a systematic process. We know we've got the IUPAC systematic way of naming molecules, where to put the hyphens, where to put the numbers. Do you do it in alphabetical or in size of the substituent? There's a lot of thinking that goes on there and you can model that thinking process in a video really well. Whereas I think teaching students about functional groups could be done with an activity sheet, getting them to review textbook material. So that's, that's my take on how, would you, how might you select which things should be delivered in a video or not? Okay, so you've decided to make a video, fantastic. Storyboarding, I think, is a really important step that comes before you even start thinking about the script for the video, the, the bits and pieces that might go on the screen, whether your face is on the screen, and you keep it really simple. In fact, what I was doing from the very beginning of this little bit was making a storyboard for this section. So, uh, it's, it, it's a really simple process. You can do it like this, just using boxes and putting key ideas in each of those boxes and having them in the sequential order that you think the video should go in. As a general rule, I'm only looking to teach one concept in a video. That's not a golden rule. It's not something you should always adhere to. But you know, there's this kind of rule of thumb that videos shouldn't be too long. Now, a lot of people will quote you a time and the educational psychology says that videos should never be longer than 7.5 minutes and all these sorts of things. I think it depends on the topic, to be perfectly honest. Sometimes they need to be a bit longer. But I don't know if you should be aiming to do too much more than one key concept, maybe a couple of key concepts in a video before you start hitting cognitive overload. So keep it simple. So once you've actually got your storyboard together, it doesn't need to be too long, too big. Then you can start thinking about, well, what are you actually going to say in the video? You've got this sort of, I guess, broad snapshot of what the video is about. Now you can start thinking about what are you actually going to say? When you record the video, should you be reading from a script or should it be sort of just flowing in a more organic fashion? I think that's up to you. I think some people are really good at winging it. Some people are really comfortable and know their material back to front. Others, probably feel the same way, but they don't want to miss out on any key points. So they might go to one end of the spectrum and have a full scripted dialogue, or they might just have key points and a list of those things as they're recording to make sure they don't forget anything. The most important thing about making videos, and other guys are going to talk about this as they go through, you don't have to do it in one take. Sometimes you make a video in 20 takes and you stitch it all together. So keep it simple. How long should my video go for? I've touched on this briefly already. Um, some people think keep them short, five to eight minutes. That's great. But what if you have three hours of material in total? That's going to add up to a lot of videos. If a student opens up their lesson plan and they see, I've got to watch 30 videos, that could be pretty overwhelming. So just think about how you package things together. Ultimately, your curriculum is a journey for students. It's the video content, the reading material, 
and it's the activities you're going to do in person and the homework that they're going to do. Make it sequential and make sure it's not too overwhelming. But you're all great educators. You don't need me to tell you that. But I think it's an important reminder when it comes to thinking, where do the videos fit and how long should they be? And finally, okay, so I've decided I am going to make a video on this particular topic. How do I actually make the video? There's so many different ways to do it. I'm not quite sure where to start. And I think that's a really good point for me to hand over. In terms of, um, I guess, creating some things, I'm looking at um, the aspect of demonstration videos. Um, and I think one of the things that I've found in terms of <clears throat> what content is out there already, um, there is a lot of information out there, a lot of videos about explanations, but there's not so much the demonstrations that you want to actually give in class. Um, for instance, there's the uh, a number of equilibrium style demonstrations and some titrations. Whilst the ones that have already been made um, may cover some aspects of it, nothing's probably going to do it justice the way that you want it to be done. And you'll probably end up talking to um, your students to say, watch this, but then remember we do it like this a little bit differently. So I find um, some of the demonstrations that I do um, and explanations around that um, really good for me to um, just do something really simple. Um, recording um, demonstrations, obviously you need a camera. Uh, everyone mostly has one because they've got one of these guys, which is a iPhone um, or a phone in general. And you've also got one of these guys, which is a retort stand. This is my go-to setup for recording anything because I still have my two hands of showing the kids how we can actually put together a retort stand quickly because for some reason, they have no idea how to use a boss head. But um, that's how I kind of look at it. Um, so what I'm going to look at as well is how to get the recording once you've done it off your phone and how it can be utilized in that area. So one thing you might want to record um, is a simple titration of a strong base with a weak acid. For instance, it might be aspirin and sodium hydroxide where you can actually find the percentage purity of an aspirin tablet. That's always a nice one to do or simply vinegar. So comparing the, um, the different acidities of home brand vinegar to some commercial things. Uh, that's another demonstration that or an investigation, which is a really good lead into um, obviously area study three, which is um, the investigation that could be obviously in year 11 um, because it technically is analyzing something in water um, and also year 12 because you can basically do it on anything in the course, which is fantastic. So simply put, um, you line up your camera with the, what you want to film. You make sure you're actually on video mode um, because numerous times I've pressed record, but it's actually been taking photos. So you're careful on that area. Um, and once you've done it, you can simply record make sure you're in the view of your thing, record your titration, and you might just want to say, show what happens when you simply add the, drop the base and get the color change. Um, or you want to look at what happens when you go way past an endpoint. So you can be demonstrating any of this aspect and say, this is way too much base, or you can show them exactly what the endpoint is supposed to look at. Um, once it's recorded, um, I'll now share my screen in terms of where to find that because obviously there is a way of getting um, movies off your, your phone. Um, you can email them to yourself or you can simply plug it in. Um, and I've got a PC at the moment. Um, I, with a Mac, it's much easier. But if I quickly show you that Just when you plug your phone in, you end up with um, your iPhone. And in here is all your photos. Um, it looks a bit weird because Apple is a bit weird for PCs, but the most recent thing is going to be in the highest number of the folder. Um, and then you can see I've got a whole bunch of stuff here. But if I um, look at it in terms of the date that they were recorded, um, I should be able to see the most recent thing is this guy. If I copy that across to the desktop, um, hopefully it will actually copy properly. There it is. And there's your recording of what you've actually done. And that's as simple as it can be um, in terms of if you're ready um, to record everything, use a retort stand on the phone. You don't need um, fancy pants um, technology, um, things that you already have. 
within your um, PC, there's a number of different programs that you can use to edit this as well. So if you want to do some cutting up and changing it or adding some background music and things like that. Um, again, with a Mac, it's much easier because you have iMovie on there straight away. And that's um, something that there are a bazillion tutorials on how to use. And even if you just open it up and start dragging stuff around, it's not too bad. But with Windows 10, um, there is now finally a simple movie editor with that as well. So this is what I have used um, most recently in terms of putting together a whole bunch of how-to videos. Obviously our remote learning information is all there as well. Um, if I just create a new video project, you can then um, name it, drag that video in, um, and then you can start to play around with editing it here as well. So you can trim and split the clip, um, and you can also actually change the speed, which allows you to um, make effects like in the cinematic movies, like this um, thing's titled, Making Movies. Um, so changing the speed allows you to do slow motion um, aspects of things as well, um, which might be helpful if you're trying to showcase a reaction which is over in a split second like the thermite or um, our beautiful sodium um, in water. That's a great one for slow motion um, and even methane bubbles. So that's one thing that I have found is one of the, my go-to demonstrations for anything to do with um, a chemical reaction, balancing chemical equations, you just, you burn some methane um, and it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but again, if you slow-mo that, it looks even beautiful, more beautiful. So um, in terms of slow motion, um, again, split the clip means you can um, change it. So for instance, if I want to get to the point where I've just added the, um, the base to it, I could find that point there and I can say done and it will split the clip into half. And again, split the clip again to where I want the slow motion to stop. So if I come back here to um, just after that, for example, uh, maybe there, um, that gives me three areas. And then I can turn this one, if I select the middle one, I can change the speed on that one to be a bit slower. And that way, if I play it right from the start, um, you'll see that as it gets to that middle section, that will slow down that middle part. So um, it's just using the software that's already on your computer. There's nothing you need to buy as such, um, but there are obviously um, things out there like Nick's going to talk about um, that will help you. Obviously there's a slow motion part there um, that can make a bit more, um, have a bit more quality to it as well. But I find sometimes the simplest thing is the best and a retort stand and a um, camera works wonders for me. Um, so that's one aspect of making videos in terms of demonstrations. Um, filming what you're doing is one thing that I quite, I find quite good. And once you get um, organized with it, you can pretty much do it as you're doing the demonstration to your students. Because another aspect of with this, you can also take out the sound from your demonstration. Um, that will allow you to remove any background noise. And then you can just have it as the simple plain demonstration that you're, you're doing. Um, you might wonder, what if I want to narrate it as well? Well, then you can do your narrations afterwards if you um, make a PowerPoint. And I think Nick's going to talk about PowerPoint um, in that area as well, and how that can be utilized to create um, videos. So there's a few options in there in terms of that. And throughout my videos that I've made for chemistry um, under the Chemisode um, tagline, um, I've done it in a number of different ways. I've recorded some which are straight from the um, camera, but then some that I've actually gone and put into um, PowerPoint and then narrated over the PowerPoint as the video is playing as well. So you start to see how you can incorporate some of these techniques together to make something that kind of fits the bill a bit more. Um, the other aspect that I was going to talk about um, once you've got your movies done is um, looking at the engagement of the students in your um, class to see how they're actually going with it. But what I might do is I might um, throw back to Nick because this is looking at um, making of the movies. So I think I might pause on that and let Nick talk about um, some other aspects of that. Thanks, Jase. 
Okay, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about PowerPoint and Camtasia because all of the videos that I've created, I've only used PowerPoint and I've used Camtasia. Now, Camtasia is a product that costs some money and I'll talk about that down the track, but I wanted to talk about PowerPoint first and the flexibility that PowerPoint actually has, which I'm sure everyone has access and has used PowerPoint. And because you've already got your presentations in PowerPoint, you've probably used a lot of those when you've been speaking with your um, students and doing the one-on-one, -on -one, or sorry, the group, what do we call it? Um, yeah, the online learning over the um, COVID. Um, but anyway, one of the things we can do is we can record straight in PowerPoint. And that can be a good way of just getting your words onto PowerPoint. And if you're using Windows, that's as simple as going up to a little button up the top, which will bring you up with a menu. And there's a little um, video here which shows how to do that. But I find that a really, really old way of doing it. Um, people need to watch each PowerPoint slide to get that audio up. But it is a way of just recording your voice onto the PowerPoints. Want to record yourself and oh, there we go. She's going to start talking right now. We didn't want that to happen. We want that to happen. Um, that doesn't seem to work. I've just had a look. It doesn't seem to work with Mac. And so the easiest way if you want to screen record with Mac is to use... <coughs> is that me making noises? Or is that Jace blowing things up? Okay, um, it's to screen, um, to quick time to screen record. Now that's really easy to do. So if I'm just going to chuck out of here and I'm going to have to share my whole screen, I think that's going to be easier. Um, okay, there we go. So you can all see yourselves and wave to yourselves at the moment. Um, hello, yep, thank you, Jace. Okay, so if you go to quick time down the bottom here and you go onto this menu, you'll see that you've got a new screen recording menu there. So you can just go up to here and this is basically just a record button. So you can either record your entire screen or you can record a selected portion of the screen and then you can just record. And so that's at the moment recording currently and it's hard to tell it's recording. The only way we know it's recording is we get this little stop button up the top here. So what we can do then is when we stop, that's now recorded and that's sitting there and I can play that back now, the PowerPoint record. Um, you've got the option when we are doing this, now it's going to do lots of strange things. Um, you've got the option when we are doing this, I'll just bring you back to this menu because this is great for any Mac users, is that you can use different microphones there. You can save it to wherever you want to save it. There's also a couple of little other options there that you can use as well. Um, so that sorry, sorry, Nick, one aspect of that as well is if you have your iPhone plugged into your computer, your iPhone camera comes up as an option to record as well straight from your phone. So again, um, rather than having to record and put it from your phone to there, you can record your camera straight to your Mac. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jase. I'm just going to have to de-record now. Okay, what was on the next one? Um... Okay, so another option that we've got is something called Screencast or Screencast-O-Matic. Oh, it's a type of screencasting. And this is a free piece of software that you can use. The free pieces of software are really, really, really useful. The only problem is most of them have a limit of how much you can record. And as Chris was saying before, and I completely agree with, I think all of your tutorials should be aimed at about sort of five minute maximum. You know, some can be over, some can be under, but that seems to be an achievable amount of time. And I even found that if you say to kids, you know, I want you to watch three or four five minute videos, that makes it all sound a lot easier than watch 20 minutes of videos. It's just a psychological thing as well, but I think then they can break it up and it's easier to, to differentiate between those different topics. Um, the other, um, I find, a uh, challenge with using this free screencasting is that you can't edit. And editing is one of your biggest tools and biggest time savers when it comes to making videos. And this is where this product called Camtasia comes in. And this is a product that's used by a lot, a lot, a lot of people. Um, it does come in at a price of $259.91. That was as of today. Um, that's the education price. Now, that is the price, a one-off price. You can upgrade every year or every second year. That price goes up and up and up as, um, sorry, the, the, what am I trying to say? So, the, you can keep 2020, for instance, and it still keeps working. So, it continually gets upgraded. Um, but you don't get the new features on the new Camtasia. So I think I'm still running at the moment at the previous version, which is about Camtasia 2018. So I haven't had to pay a subscription per year. But you can also get site licenses and a lot of schools are going in for the site licenses. Whoops. 
sorry, my computer's jumping all over the place. You can get a site license. Um, and if the school's got that, jump on board and have a go. It's really, really quick and easy to use. It's got so much functionality. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of that in a second. Um, what I wanted to talk about too is when you create your PowerPoints for video, if that's the way you choose to use it, it's really important when you're making PowerPoints for video to make sure that the PowerPoints are engaging because we don't want this sort of scenario where the kids fall asleep. You know what it's like having been on the computer for so many hours. It's really quite exhausting. So we want engagement. We want colours. We want video. We want less words and more of you talking. Oops, sorry jumping ahead. You want your PowerPoints to be concise. Um, you're doing a video and the best thing about a video is you don't have to repeat yourself over and over and over again because students have the ability to pause or to rewind and to do all of those sort of things. So when in class, I know when I teach, I'll repeat the same concept in two or three different ways and then, you know, Debbie will interrupt and this will happen. When you're doing a video, you don't need to repeat that. You might want to sort of describe it in a different manner. You're the teachers, you know what you're doing, but you don't have to do that constant repetition. Um, so, oops, sorry, my mouse is really excited today. Um, as I said, diagrams and GIFs can be made. All of these different GIFs here that I've made, I've made using PowerPoint. Um, so, oh, sorry, I don't know what's happening on this side. Okay, so what we need to do, it goes back to the old fashioned, if you want to do something like this, it's a little bit of fun, it takes a little bit of time, but you're literally doing that old fashioned, like the little flip book where you draw the man in the corner and you've got his hand and he goes this way, this way, this way, this way, this way. And then you run them through really quickly and it makes it look as though everything's moving. That's exactly what I've done with all of these here. I've just made a, um, a PowerPoint. And then I've just put it onto the next PowerPoint or I've put animations in. And that can be visually um, appealing to students. But the other thing is it's a lot easier to describe, for instance, fragmentation and ionisation in a GIF like this or in a diagram that's moving in an animation rather than just trying to explain it with words. Um, and this is just what I mean from having a couple of different PowerPoints. That's literally all I did there was having this and then had it go and then had to keep going and going and going. So um, it's not that challenging to do once you've done the first one, but it is time consuming. And as Chris said, this is one of the benefits of having so many different resources available to you is that you don't need to go and create these. But these are just some options for you if you do decide you want to create them. Um, Chris was also talking about different... Um, things that are good to put into video. Now, I've flipped the entire course and so I've put everything into video and some of it can be quite dry. For instance, a question like this. Um, I didn't want this all to come up. I just wanted to show you that. Okay, so this would be a normal slide that you have and I kind of gave away what I wanted to do, but this would be your normal slide and you'd be teaching and you'd be talking everything through. Sorry, it keeps jumping. I don't know why. Okay, but instead of having a slide like this, when you're making a video, if you just put a little bit of, um, break it up a little bit. And so what I wanted to show you is what that actually looks like here. Naming an alcohol, or we're naming an ester. Oh, that's we not the right the one, hang on. That's what happens when you screen share. So I'm going to volumetric analysis. Um, where are we? Okay, so what I've just done there, I'll just make that a bit bigger. So you can see here, so I'll just show you a couple of minutes of it. Calculating, calculation, and we will put the information that we've got in the question below the equation. So as we read, 20 mil aliquot of... So you can see here, it's easy to circle things. You can use the cursor to keep the, the student's attention fixed on what you're showing. I'll show you, put that volume down a little bit. Um, use different colours to show, okay, well, this is the sodium hydroxide that we're talking about. This is the ethanoic acid we're talking about. Use animations to circle things. Use your cursor and make sure that kids can follow what you're actually saying. But that sort of goes on and on. But you can also use things like popping in your triangle to show them at that point what that is. Put the answer here, put that back up the top. And that's what I mean by just thinking about what you want to do and just spreading those slides out a little bit, just to make it a little bit visually more interesting for students. Um, I need to go back to that page. That's what we wanted there. That's what we wanted there. Um, 
Okay, and then I just wanted to really quickly, I was supposed to be recording all of that time to show you a little bit of Camtasia. So here is my Camtasia. So I've just opened it up here and this is really disconcerting with that on, but I'll just record a little bit while I am talking. So it's a simple Camtasia is just hitting start record like so. So we hit start recording, we make sure our um, audio is working and I always do a bit of a clap just to double check that it's working because there's nothing worse than recording a video and you haven't done your little clap and you start recording and basically it's going to record whatever's on the screen or you can make this size a little bit smaller and record to whatever you like. So we can make that bigger, we can work our way through, I'm talking through my video, la 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 la, oops I made a mistake. What I recommend doing is you either clap or you leave a little pause. And I'll show you why in a minute because it makes editing a little bit easier. Okay, there we go. I've gotten to the end of my video. I'm going to stop. Oh, I just stopped sharing. That was not helpful. Hello, everybody. You're all back on my screen. And I'm going to share again. Can you see my screen? Okay, I got one nod. I got two nods. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've come up to this thing up here. I hit stop recording. And here's what I've just recorded literally. I can drag that down. Sorry, there's one that I did earlier. I can drag that one down to the bar here. And now it's so easy to record, um, to edit anything. You can see here, okay, well, I didn't want all of that front bit. So I'm just going to go like that. I'm going to cut that little bit off and I'm going to ripple delete. So there we go. I'm going to start from that point. If I want to, I'm going to look for where my claps are. There's my loud clap. If I play that, you can hear the clap. So I'll go back and I'll listen to my voice recording there. So I can now cut out this section. I'm going to make it a bit bigger because it's hard to see. Okay, and then I can just cut that section out here and then I've edited that little bit. Oops, hang on. And I can just slide that back. Okay, so it's as simple as that. And there's so many different functionalities that you can use with it. You can annotate, so you can put in a little, I want to put a little bubble because it's important or I want to point to something because that's important. You can put transitions in, so you can fade in, you can fade out. You can um, make words do things. There's animations you can put in. And there's even some interactivity that you can add some quizzes to it. But I'd need 15, 20 hours to go through all of this with you. But I just wanted to show you that it's something that's there and it's available um, and it's something that's really quite simple to use, but it will save you so much time when it comes to editing your videos. And one of the other important things to remember is when you are editing your videos, don't worry about things like saying, um, or having little, oh, I forgot, you know, or your screen flicked out. People or students don't really care about that. That's what they get when you're in class with you. They really don't mind those certain things. So don't spend a lot of time worrying about ums and ahs. It doesn't have to be perfect. The point is to get the message across to the students. Okay, that's me done for a bit. I will stop sharing. Who are we on to next? Chris, I think. Yeah, look, just, just me really briefly. Um, I'm just going to, again, share my screen. And I was, where was I going to go to? Uh, this one here, I think. Um, just going to really quickly talk about, can I move that? Uh, my channel on YouTube. Um, I go to that page there. There we go. Look, years ago, um, when I started making these videos, it, you know, at the university, we have a learning management system. A lot of your schools are going to have different learning management systems where you host content. Um, this year with homeschooling, I learned about something called Seesaw. It was pretty horrible. But anyway, let's not go down that path. One of the most simplest ways to host video content is via YouTube. It's, it, it's kind of faultless in that YouTube is so big, it's robust enough to work on just about any device. So Mac, PC, Linux, any smartphone you can imagine, YouTube will probably work. So it is a good um, hosting option. This is uh, my channel, so I created it. All you need to have your own channel is your own Gmail um, email address, and then you can, you can uh, create your own channel. And very simply, once you're in there, you'll have this little button up the top right-hand corner, hover your mouse, you can see it says create. You click on that, go to upload video, 
and you can either select the file manually, drop and drag the MP4, or you might have used a different format. I usually use MP4 uh, and drop it in there and it will just start uploading. While it's uploading, I'm not gonna do it in real time, just gonna speak about this really quickly. You can name the video, you can adjust the settings. Now I know this is something that a lot of you care about. You don't want the rest of the world seeing your video, you just want your students seeing your video. Well, you can change the settings from either public to so-called unlisted. Now that doesn't mean that's completely locked down, but people need the URL to access it. They can't just search it and it will come up. It can be a link that you send to your students and they'll in principle be the only ones who can watch the video. Of course, they can share that link with their mum and dad and they can watch it as well, but that's probably not gonna happen. Or you can have it to completely private settings and you have to add people manually for them to be able to view the video. And that will come up in those different settings there. If you go into the analytics section, which is a, is a bit of a menu on the left-hand side, you can actually look at how many of your videos have been watched, how many views they've received. Uh, if I click on a particular video, I can see analytics about that video, how many times it's been watched. You gotta love this one, audience retention. Well, pretty quick drop off early on. For some reason, it highlighted at four minutes 10, who knows why. Uh, and then you can see only 18% of people watched it right to the end. Now, this goes back to video duration that we were talking about earlier. If you make a 15 minute video, you can expect this to really tail off. So short and sharp is um, the evidence, all the evidence will tell you short and sharp is best, not just for sort of minimizing cognitive overload, but just in terms of keeping students' attention. Look, this is really easy, so I'm not gonna spend any more time on this, but when we're talking about engagement, I'm gonna to throw to Jason, who's got some really nice tips and ways of measuring and keeping engagement up. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, and that's what one of the things that our school particularly wanted to look at with our remote learning as well. Um, and obviously, um, whilst we're out of the, well, currently we're we're face to face. Um, back to it. Um, I think if you are looking at flipping or blending what you're learning with online videos, I think looking to see engagement is really important. And whilst YouTube does have the um, the audience retention and it does have the view count there, it doesn't say exactly who um, has looked at it. And that's where having other things that support the engagement of students as well is really important. So that's that's my. Thing there, I was just looking at that as we go along. Um, a couple of things that we've looked at for engagement were simply using the Google Suite um, on Google Apps for Education and, and putting in Google quizzes. So one thing that I, I did is have simple Google quizzes with in, in embedding a video to start with. So when I share this um, Google quiz with the students, they see it that as it comes up like this. Actually, I've already filled it in, so I, I can't do it. I just changed the settings on that, so I can actually fill it in again. Um, uh, it will look similar to this. So the video comes up here as an embedded link um, that can be played, um, and you can get the theory, I guess, that you're you're delivering. Um, and underneath it, you might have your questions. Um, this is a whole bunch of multiple choice questions that I found um, on a lovely resource by Googling it. Um, and with this, I didn't have to write it all out again. All I do is simply um, do a screenshot and put the, the picture in there and put in a reoccurring A, B, C, D, E. So it doesn't take a lot of time to, to create a lot of questions from things that you've already seen and past exam papers and things like that. So that way, um, once the students um, watch the video, they do a quick little quiz. This one was a bit longer than normal um, with about 14 or 15 questions. Um, from that, you actually get the results in a spreadsheet as well. So you can see um, how many they got right and their, their responses. And obviously a bit of unpacking of that data allows you to simply see what, where people went right and where people severely went wrong. For instance, this question four was something to, to highlight. And obviously I didn't explain that very well. Um, and that was something I needed to look at um, in class a bit more. So engagement through using Google Forms is a, is a great tool to, to do, to use. Um, alongside that, I also, through our remote learning, um, our school's Google Apps for Education, but again, this will fly for most um, other, uh, like Microsoft schools and using Microsoft Teams and things like that. Um, 
I um, created Google Docs and had the students use these as templates for their work as well. So for example, um, when I was looking at carbohydrates, um, there was um, some content and then I simply just shared this document so they could actually um, fill in the worksheet as such. Again, which was a way of seeing who's engaging with, with the information and, and what's hitting home and what's not. So that's um, one aspect of using Google Docs. The other area um, which a lot of schools have access to is ClickView. Um, this is an absolutely amazing resource um, which allows you to create interactive videos. Um, so for example, I've taken a couple of other ones and made them interactive as well. But for these, um, clicking on this, what this allows you to do is create a video and overlay it with a number of different questions. So as soon as it gets to a particular point into the video, um, there will be a question that will pop up. Hopefully there it is. If I just move that over that side and the students then respond to that and then it moves forward. What you get out of that is analytics of um, what the students have answered, but you also get, um, as YouTube does the, the analytics in terms of audience retention, you actually see exactly how much the students have watched. Um, and there's a, there's a bar graph of that goes orange when the students have watched it. And you can often see the fact that they've watched the first um, 30 seconds and the last 10 seconds and pretended that they've actually done it. Um, and that really helped with our school in determining engagement within our online um, environment that we created in there. And there's, other, there's lots of other tools in terms of that, but it's really about looking at your, um, looking at what you're used to using in terms of online um, assessment and then providing that alongside the video. I also use a lot of interactive Kahoots. So Kahoot is, a, is an amazing um, tool for um, in class, looking at gamifying your, your class in terms of having students competing against each other. But there's also not just the um, in class version, there is the, I can't remember what they actually call it, but there's an offline, like the not in class version where they, it's self-paced. Um, and they go off and then they do the Kahoot, but they do it at separate times for homework. And that, again, you get the analytics of that and you can unpack all the data you want. Um, I love looking at data as well. Um, in terms of Angelina's question or Angela's question, it does show specific students um, because what you can do is assign students to a class. Actually, no, you don't assign students to a class. You simply provide them with the interactive link and um, they, their details then will be filtered into your interactive. I would show it, but it shows um, data for students. So I'd love to do that, but um, I'm not gonna, I can't blur that information out. But it definitely does show specific students, which again, was a key component of what we wanted to look at there. So really, really good tools for checking engagement. Google Forms, ClickView and Kahoot, amazing tools. Um, that's pretty much the aspect of looking at engagement. Um, I'm gonna throw it back to, I think, um, Nick or Chris looking at how we can look at combining the, the, um, the videos with our own classroom teaching. Yeah, hi, um, thanks Jace, that was great. Um, I'm just sort of wondering, because we've got 10 minutes left, is it worth breaking off into some rooms now? Because I was gonna talk a little bit um, in particular about flipped learning. And I guess before we do break off into different rooms, um, what I would like to say is that there's a couple of real benefits to flipped learning. And I think we've come a long way over the last year or so. We've all had to dive into this online learning environment. It was all pretty scary. And it's going to be really interesting to see whether we all just go back to normal classroom teaching or whether we take some of the positives um, that flipped learning or blended learning um, does have and can have. And I just wanted to run through a couple of those. Um, I love this slide here, and I'm just gonna have to share my whole screen again, because for some reason. All right, what are you seeing at the moment? A PowerPoint slide. 
Oh, good. That's exactly what I wanted. Okay. I love this PowerPoint here because this is what got me into flipped learning. This is learning throughout the generations. And all it is is the teacher in front of some sort of board. The board keeps changing, but the teacher stands at the front, the kids stand at the back. And it's not collaborative learning. Um, oh, that was me drawing earlier. So I just, yeah, I'll skip all of that. Okay. So the great thing about um, flipped learning is that you get this collaboration. Um, students are able to come into the classroom and instead of you sitting there or standing there lecturing the students, you're able to allow them to collaborate and particularly in chemistry where they seem to go home and then struggle doing textbook questions or worksheets, whatever you've given them to do. And then they come to class and they sit there staring out the window and maybe, you know, miss half the stuff that you say. Because I don't know about you, you probably listen. Well, I, I don't listen to everything when I'm sitting in a classroom listening to anybody. But they get a chance then to go home and actually listen to those videos carefully and rewind sections that they don't understand and listen to those sections again. So when they come into class, they can collaborate with one another and get help from both one another. And more importantly, or as importantly, get help with teachers one on one. When I flipped my class completely in year 11 and 12, I could not believe how much extra class time I had. I went from having pretty much zero class time to spend with my students to being sitting out the front going, does anyone need my help? Anyone? Anyone? Like it was, it was quite amazing and I got to know my students so much better. I got to spend a lot more time running through exam techniques and doing practice and demonstrations and problem solving. So there's a lot to be said about implementing either the completely flipped or just the blended um, learning because it does free up a lot of time. Um, it looks like there's a little kid that's been scrolling on my screen. Um, but it does transform students from being passive, passive listeners into active learners. And it's something I hope that some of you've seen over the, this year is that some of the kids that maybe didn't engage as much did actually take some responsibility for their learning um, and sort of realise that it is their choice that whether they can, you know, learn this or not learn this. And, you know, this is the way that all the universities are working now as well. Um, so it's a really good step up for that. But, you know, there's so many advantages of, you know, the flipped learning model. Here's some of them now. Um, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. There. So, yeah, so as I said, I'm a huge advocate for flipped learning. Um, if you've ever got any questions or you need some help or you're interested in bulk science, get on to me. Um, I love it. I think it's great. It's got benefits for the teacher. It's not just for the students. You have a lot more time. You can keep to your schedule a lot more easily. Um, it's great. That's all I have to say. Chris? Yeah, no, thanks, Nick. Uh, there's, there is so much to talk about. and We've only nominally got an hour or so. We are going to break off into some, uh, into some breakout rooms and we won't come back as a group after that. We'll probably just keep talking to people for as long as they're happy to talk to us. But I was just going to close out with a, with a bit of a comment. And this is something that the three of us agree on. Um, and that is that, that, that videos are not the panacea. To, to chemistry education. They're not, you cannot just replace our amazing teaching with videos. This year we've had to rely on them. They were actually coming onto the, onto the scene, you know, over the last 10 years, more and more. Um, and clearly they're a fantastic tool, particularly in chemistry where we've got all the different representations um, that we use to, to, to represent atoms and molecules uh, to get students to really see things in three dimensions and to use their imagination but they're not the panacea. And some of the things Jason was talking about, about how you integrate learning with the video. Either you have moments that halfway through a video where they have to answer a question, or you, they watch a video and then answer a series of questions. They can't just watch the video and suddenly they've learned it. So it's not a panacea, but um, I think we all agree that they're a really important tool going forward. And of course, we know that this generation, they've just They've grown up with videos, so it's a natural part of the way that they engage, not just with their learning, but I mean, my son, he just watches other people playing computer games on YouTube for hours and hours and hours.